All right guys, so this is the strongest floating shelf I've ever built. Now the normal thing to do would be to go on Amazon or go to the hardware store and get a set of floating shelf hardware and use that. That would be the normal thing to do. But normal is boring. I got into this business so I could test the boundaries. Through trial and error, just keep testing different methods and techniques so that each project could get better and better. So in this video, I'm going to show you a new floating shelf technique I'm testing out. The basic concept is to use solid steel rods embedded in the wall in solid blocking to be able to support this shelf stronger than using screws. The biggest challenge was getting us to work on an L-shaped corner. I needed to be able to slide it into place, but also support it from both the left side and the right side. Some things worked, some things didn't. I'm going to show you how I built it, the engineering principles behind why it works, and what I would do differently next time. You can use the chapters to jump around, so stick around and check it out. All right, so first we gotta start with a sheet of Pluma Ply. Pluma Ply is a really cool product because it is basically a cross between MDF and a veneer plywood. So I get the strength of a veneer plywood, but the painting ability of MDF. Really cool product. Now here you see there's a little bow in my board, so I decided to flip it over so that when I glue it together, it'll counteract some of those internal stresses that this board seems to have. I'm just throwing a few screws in to make it easier for me to cut uh, using my square, and I'm gonna make that L shape to get ready for the floating shelf. Using my track saw makes it nice and easy to make nice straight square cuts. Then I'll use the multi-tool to square up that, finish up that cut in the corner. So now I'm cutting up strips. These strips are basically spacers. They are the exact same thickness as the steel rods I'm gonna to use to hold the floating shelves. So I cut those strips up and now I'm laying them down on the L-shaped floating shelf to use as my spacer for around the perimeter. I do this because then this way I can It'll give a nice space, but it'll also hold the outside rigid so that this whole thing will be held nice and tight together. Once I cut the notches for each of the steel rods, the rest will still remain and it'll help hold this as a nice flat, consistent thickness. All right, so time for a glue up. Just glue in the perimeter. I don't really want any glue in the middle because it's really not necessary, but I'm gluing the strips on. I have to move quickly. This is Type On 3 that I'm using. You'll see if you notice, I, I put one layer on, wait for a minute or two for it to absorb in, and then I put a second layer of Type On 3 uh, right before I put it all together. I am putting blocks in the middle, as you see there. I, If I were to do it again, I probably would not do those blocks. I think those blocks got in the way of some of the rods that I uh, installed and you'll see later in the video what I'm talking about. Now time for clamps. And as any woodworker would tell you, you can never have too many clamps. I'm just checking for level here. It's not actually checking for level, I'm really just checking for flat, make sure that there's no humps in the, uh, in the surface. Now this point is the next day after the glue has set and I'm just taking it off, taking off all the clamps and getting it ready to cut the interior final dimension. I'm not cutting the outside yet till I'm on site with the real walls so that I can cut them to the exact dimension and to the contour of the wall. But for the inside, I'm just looking to get a nice 90 degree corner. So I chisel away at it and use my router for flush trimming and just to get a nice sharp corner on that inside. I do cut a little bit off the outside, but that's just to make it easier to uh, sand and get, get all those the glue chunks off. Here I'm doing the edge banding. I'm just running through the drum sander. I ripped down some quarter inch strips and brought them down to about an eighth of an inch thick. This is poplar. Usually I use either poplar or maple, sometimes cherry, depending upon what I have in the shop. I'm gluing the edge banding on the sides in the front. I'm using a 23 gauge pin nailer, but when I really, but that's only to hold it in place. 
the real pressure comes from the tape here. And you'll see that's why I use so much of it. I love this tape. This is the rough surface tape from 3M. It just sticks really, really well. It doesn't pop off like standard blue painter's tape. This stuff just holds well. However, in this particular situation, this was uh, basically like an MDF surface. I probably wouldn't use it again for this. I really, I use it all the time for solid hardwood and it works incredibly well. It has a little bit of springiness to it, which provides that clamping action. And this is really enough pressure. Now I'm doing a quick sand only to about 150. So now it's time to prep for paint. And what I'm doing here is called glue sizing. Basically that means taking wood glue, like a PVA wood glue, this is type Typefine 3, and I'm diluting it 50% with water and then giving it a nice, even, heavy coat. And then I kind of scrape off a lot of the puddling because I'm not looking for it to puddle, I just want to seal the surface of those wood fibers. MDF loves to absorb moisture. So any of these uh, types of products I like to really seal first before I prime it. Now it's time to prime, and I'm using here Bin Shellac Primer by Zinzer, which is my absolute favorite primer. I cannot say anything bad about it. It dries quickly, it sands well, it seals all types of wood, including MDF, it seals out smoke stains, whatever you need. Great product. So now, so now we're finally on site, and I am just marking out a location for where I want the shelf to go. I have all the studs marked out, I've got my laser up, and I'm gonna put some tape across and I'm gonna mark each of the studs and the height of the shelf. Now a critical part of this is that the only reason I am comfortable doing this design is because I framed these walls. So I know exactly what is behind these walls. So I caution you to make sure that if you're gonna use this style of, of bracket, uh, make sure you know exactly what is in those walls and make sure that they are not load-bearing walls. These are internal walls. I know that there are no utilities and I know that I can drill all the way through this stub with no problem. That being said, I still want to mark to get the exact center of the stud. So that's why I'm using this jab saw here. Again, I know that there are no utilities, no electric, no plumbing right there. So I can, I can cut into the wall without worrying that I'm going to hit anything. And all I'm doing is trying to mark the exact location of the left and right side of each stud so I can pinpoint the exact center, which a stud finder will get you close, but it will not be as precise as this. So now I mounted a ledger and that ledger is gonna help me make a template. I like to use this corrugated plastic. I just get it from Home Depot and it, I slice it up into little strips and I use it to make a template. I use hot glue. I've got a cordless hot glue gun, which by the way, side note, fantastic. Didn't know you needed a cordless hot glue gun until you have one. Now I use it all the time. So for a product like this, it allows me to, to quickly make a template just like this and uh, be able to tie it together, the pieces together. Now I'm outside and what I'm doing here is I'm cutting the contour of the wall. You'll see I'm using a very short track saw that's intentional. The short track saw is because the wall is not perfectly straight. So a long track saw will just be one straight line and I don't want to do that. So instead I use a short track saw anytime I'm doing uh, a contour of a wall if I'm having to scribe along a surface to, to make it uh, follow the uh, bumps. And then here I'm using the belt sander just to bring it down to the exact location of the line so that I know uh, I'm going to be I'm going to fit nice and tight against the wall. Time to finally drill out the holes where the rods are going to go. These are going to be half inch rods and I am going to basically just remove those half inch blocks that I made, those spacer blocks, and that once I remove those half inch blocks, I'll have a nice opening for the rod to slide into. I'm using, uh, I just use a Forstner bit to drill the hole and then I'm using a flush trim bit just to cut out the remainder so that I'll have some nice channels for the rods to go into. So the other side was much trickier because it needed to have a long channel so that I could slide it into place because of the L shape. You'll see when I 
slide the shelf into place for its final location, what I'm talking about. So unfortunately what I neglected to record was the drilling of the holes to put those rods in. Those are half inch solid steel rods. Uh, I drilled the hole in and then slid the shelf into place and put a heavy amount of PL inside of the hole. The hole was drilled at about 5 eighths of an inch and this is a half inch rod so it gave plenty of room for a round for, to wiggle into place and line everything up. This is the next day after that PL has set up and basically I'm chiseling away all of the excess glue so that I can get nice and flush and tight to the wall. And I'm using an old chisel here because when you chisel up against metal, you'll ruin the chisel. But here it's not really a big deal because it's an older chisel. Finally time for the final fit. And basically I have to slide it into one side and this is what those channels were for. And then slide it in back on the second side. So I'm gonna get a nice snug fit tight into the corner, looking good. So let's talk about why this works and why it's better than some other methods. For an analogy, I'm gonna use a deck on a house. Take a look at this model. This is a deck I built a few years ago. The deck is supported on columns and mounted to the outside of the house with a ledger board. Let's look at just the framing below. If we were to eliminate the columns, the deck would fall down. No matter how strong you attach those lag screws to the house, it would never be sufficient. Now let's extend the beams into the house. Then if you were to remove the columns, the deck would still stay floating. Don't get me wrong, a more thorough structural analysis would, needed, would be needed to determine the exact beam size, the length of the beams, and the length of the cantilever. And it probably wouldn't work for this particular deck, but the concept still holds. This is what we call in engineering a moment connection. Essentially, in, scenar in scenario one, the screws are holding the ledger board to the house, and it's only the strength of those screws and the friction they create with the ledger board that is supporting the deck. However, in scenario two, the beam itself would need to fail or crack at the point of the house, which is much less likely to happen. So let's bring it back to the shelf. If the bars are mounted to the surface of the wall, say with a welded plate, there are a few ways that the bar can fail. First, the screws can come loose. This is a function of how good the pullout strength is of the screws. The second way is that the plate can actually crush the drywall. The smaller the plate, the longer the bars, the higher the leverage force. That can be enough to cause sagging in the shelf. Now let's embed the bars into the wall. As long as it's in solid blocking, like a stud or additional blocking added between studs, we can assume it's solidly fixed. Now, the only mode of failure is the steel rod bending, which is much more difficult than the screws failing. All right guys, so this project turned out to be a little more complicated than I thought. There's a few things I'd do differently. Next time around, I probably would use a different adhesive. I use PL Premium on here by Loctite. Love this product, I use it all the time for any sort of heavy construction projects, two by fours, subfloors, any, anything that's a heavy duty construction. Uh, the only thing about this product though is that it's a slightly flexible. And that slight amount of compression or expansion will allow for too much movement. So there's a slight, I'm talking a 32nd of an inch deflection in the glue allows for a little bit more of a deflection for a 12 inch shelf. So if I were to do it again, I'd probably use a more rigid glue, maybe like an epoxy, like either the one, this one from West System, great product. Uh, or their G-Flex, which is probably my favorite epoxy. Even though it's called G-Flex, it's not really that flexible. You really want something that's a thick, thick glue. The problem is epoxies are very expensive. So you really need to use something that's a little bit, I, mean, I probably would use something that's a little bit less expensive. So they actually make PL Premium Max, and the Max supposedly is a lot more rigid. I've never used it, but it might be worth a shot. There are other adhesives as well that are very rigid. Some of them just dry a little bit too fast. So I'd probably be on the hunt for, for something that's uh, a nice thick adhesive, but super, super soft. Next to the steel rods. So for this project, I used the half inch solid steel rod. And it worked well, 
I, I was happy with it, but I think I might take it one step up and either use a, a square rod, which would just be a little bit of a beefier um, shape, which would be a little bit sturdier, or I might increase it to say to a 5 8 rod, which would also increase the flexural uh, rigidity of the, of the steel. The only problem is if you're gonna be drilling a hole that big, you really need to make sure that you know that this wall can handle it because you're gonna be drilling holes and damaging some of those studs. So my suggestion is to put some kind of blocking or extra studs that are not necessary in the wall behind before you start actually closing the wall to make sure that you have the extra support that you need and you're not gonna affect the structural integrity of the wall itself by drilling these holes. Finally, the shelves themselves. I'd probably use a different material. I like the Puma Ply, I do use them for shelves, but it's really not quite as strong as a veneer core standard plywood that has surface veneers that are also a hardwood. So this is the Puma Ply, which has the MDF on the outside and the veneer core interior. I probably would go with one that's got a bit of a stiffer exterior core because when it comes to rigidity and flexure, the outside veneers are very, very important. So although this isn't the easiest method, it's definitely the strongest. Guys, if you're interested in more content like this, please give this video a thumbs up. Consider hitting that subscribe button and hopefully I'll see you on the next one.